Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be standing here after what has been a day full of amazing presentations, like my head is spinning. Um, thank you for allowing me to take us out by sharing with you my guide on how to use pointers in Go without panicking. A quick introduction, my name is Miriam and I work as a uh, software developer at Mantle Group. Um, so my career path is something you hear more and more these days. I actually switched industries and I'm a self-taught developer. So during the long COVID lockdowns we had here in Sydney, I got really bored, a lot of time on my hands, and I started to learn how to code, and I realized just how much I loved it, and that that's what I wanted to do with my life. So I was really excited when I got my, uh, my first job with Mantle Group, been there ever since, and that's also when I first started to learn how to work with Go. And I became a, an immediate convert and advocate for it. I've worked on all of my projects in Go, and um, I've spoken at meetups, and I'm helping run an internal training in Go at our company. And yeah, I just, you know, as being, especially when you're self-taught, you have a lot of stuff to catch up on. So I'm constantly running into new things that I need to learn how they work and how to work with them. And I really enjoy looking under the hood and figuring out how they work. And I really like sharing what I find with other people because often I have very big aha moments. And today's talk is very much in that spirit. So, before we start, I want you to take a moment to kind of think back and reflect. Um, when you design your code, what is your strategy when you choose between passing by pointer or passing by value? Do you kind of go with your gut? Do you tend to choose one over the other? Or do you have a certain set of criteria you like to follow? For the longest time, I kind of went with my gut and I defaulted to using pointers most of the time because I heard they're so much more efficient and there's no downside to using them, right? Right? <laughs> so, yeah, more often than I'd like to admit, um, I ended up really regretting a design decision I'd made down the way. Um, and I, at some point, realized I needed to spend a bit more time figuring out what pointers are all about and really um, looking into what decisions I should be making when I want to pass by pointer or pass by value. And so when I started digging into it, I realized that it's a really big topic. Pointers are super interesting. There's a lot happening down there. Um, you know, people who work with C and C cell languages are probably familiar with that. And I got really excited about it. And that's why today's talk is about what we should consider when we decide to pass by pointer or pass by value. And how this talk is going to work is, first, I'm going to give a really quick intro into what are pointers and what's the syntax behind it, just as a recap. And then we're going to jump straight into the deep end. And I'm actually going to do a quiz with you all. So I'm looking forward to your participation. We're going to explore the more tantalizing aspects of working with pointers, maybe some of the pit and pratfalls. Um, and hopefully, I'm going to challenge some of the assumptions you make when you work with Go. And then finally, I'm going to present to you the three categories I found work best for me when I think about working with pointers. Great, so let's get started. So what is a pointer? A pointer points to the address and memory of another variable. So up here we have y, which is of type pointer to int, and it holds the address of x, which is of type int. So how do we make a pointer? We use an ampersand. Um, so you put an ampersand in front of uh, an existing variable in order to obtain its pointer, and then you can store it in another variable. Or, and you can use a star in front of a pointer in order to access the value held at that location in memory. That's what we call dereferencing. Okay, so I hope, you know, all the basics are covered. Let's get into the quiz. Um, <laughs> hope you're ready. So how this is going to work is I'm going to walk you through the code step by step, and I'm going to give you some possible outcomes. You get a bit to think about it, and then we're going to vote by raising our hands for which one we think is the most likeliest outcome. So some of these are a bit tricky. If you're not sure what the right answer is, just give it your best shot. And then we'll look at you know, the correct outcome, and more importantly, why. OK, so let's get started. We're doing syntax. So here I'm initializing the variable x with the value 10. I'm then initializing y as a pointer to x. Here we're using the ampersand. And then I'm going to dereference y, and I'm going to add to the dereferenced de y 20. Great. And now I'm going to print y. What do you think is going to happen? Have a second to think about it. OK, that was long enough. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> raise your hand if you think we're going to print the number 10. Raise your hand if you think we're going to print the number 30. 
Raise your hand if you think we're going to print a memory address. Great job. OK, so what is the result? We're going to print a memory address. So y is, holding a is a pointer. It's pointing to x. And therefore, it holds as a value the address in memory of x. And that's what, we're, that's what we're printing here. If I were to put a star in front of it, I would be dereferencing it, and we would be printing 30. But print line doesn't do that for us. OK, so let's look at something for your C-style language lovers out there, pointer arithmetic. So here, <laughs> we're initializing x with the value 1. Doesn't matter. What matters is the address where it's stored. So that address is ending in 0e8, for example. Then I'm going to initialize a pointer to it, PTR. And I'm going to increment that pointer. And then I'm going to print it. What do you think will happen? Yeah, everyone having a guess? OK, we're going to raise our hands. Who are your things that we're going to print the original address of x? Raise your hand. Who are your things we're going to print the address incremented by 1? Raise your hand. And who are your things we're gonna, that this code is not going to compile? OK, yeah. Thank you, Go, for that one. <laughs> so Go provides pointer safety, unlike, for example, C. Um, so you can't directly do this kind of pointer arithmetic. You could if you wanted to. I mean, there are people like that out there. So <laughs> here's what we can do. We can use the unsafe package, which gives us a pointer. And we can actually work with that pointer. So whoop. oh, no. Got it. Later, please. OK. <laughs> then we're going to cast that into the type uint ptr, which is big enough to actually hold an address. And then we can do all the shenanigans that we want to do, because we want to for some reason, and then it'll actually increment it. So that's just a fun fact. OK, next, next up, let's talk about slices, reference objects. So here I'm initializing a slice called s with the values 1, 2, 3. I'm then going to make a copy of it and give it to m. Then I'm going to change the zero entry of m to the number 99. And now I'm going to print s. OK, before we get into the quiz, quick bonus, why is this a slice and not an array syntactically? Because here I'm not putting in a number. If I put a number into these brackets, I would actually tell the code, I want to reserve this many blocks of memory in our memory address, and it would give me, it would create an array with this many, with this uh, capacity. However, here I'm making it a slice because I want Go to just dynamically calculate that for me and do all of that hard work. OK, with that being said, so we're making a copy of S to M, we're changing M, we're printing S. What do you think will happen? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. OK, everyone ready? Who here thinks we're going to print 1, 2, 3, the original value of s? Who here thinks we're going to print 99, 2, 3? Mm -hmm. And who here thinks that the outcome is non-deterministic? Great, OK. So the answer is 99, 2, 3. So this one can be a bit of a bug if you're not aware that this happens in Go. Um, so keep an eye out for it. But I can tell you why it is happening, and then it'll all make sense. So if we actually look at a slice, it's just a struct. Um, it has three fields. The second and the third one are the length and the capacity. And then the first one is actually a pointer to an underlying array. The reason for that is that arrays can be very large data structures, and we don't want to be working with them directly all the time if we can avoid it. So the slice is just having a pointer to it, which is much smaller and much more easier to work with. And so if I make a copy of s in this code, I am making a copy of it. But a copy of an address still points to the same address. And therefore, if I change this m, it changes its pointer to the array. It changes the array at its pointer, and then s gets changed too. So s and m are both pointing at the same underlying array. And that's why this is happening. OK, and that's what we call a reference object. So let's do another one. Here, we already have done a bit of work. And we have a slice, which has the content 1, 2, 3 currently. Now I'm going to use the append function, and I'm going to append 4 to it and give the result to m. Then I'm going to change m's 0 entry to 99. And I'm going to print s. Ooh, more options. What do you think will happen? This is a bit of a bigger one, so take your time. 
have a think. Okay, okay. We feeling ready? Don't stop cheating, okay? <laughs> this is not cooperative. Okay, let's look at, <laughs> let's have a vote. I'm gonna explain afterwards. Okay, everyone, please raise your hand if you think that S is still gonna have the values one, two, three. Great, okay. Please raise your hand if you think S is now gonna have 99, two, three. Mm -hmm. Please raise your hand if you think S uh, is going to print 99234. And please raise your hand if you think this is non-deterministic. Ooh, okay. The answer is it's non-deterministic. Ooh, mean, mean. Okay, let's have a look why. I'm going to explain it. Don't worry, don't worry. Okay, so it kind of depends on what has happened with S so far in our code. So I'm going to give you two scenarios here. In the first one, we're declaring S and appending immediately 1, 2, 3 to it. Now, if you remember, S, a slice, holds a length and a capacity in it, right? So let's look at that. Currently, S has a length and a capacity of 3. Now, we're going to append 4 to it. And what's now going to happen is that when we call append, uh, Go is going to use copy on append in order to try to determine if it needs to allocate a new slot in our memory and copy all the values over. It doesn't want to do that, so it's going to try to avoid doing that. In this case, it's going to see that length equals capacity, so the underlying array doesn't have any more space to, for us to add any more numbers to it. So Go is forced to allocate a new block in memory and copy over the values one, two, three, and then it appends the number four, and so then it gives that new slice to M. So at this point, S and M are pointing to two different arrays. And so if we change M, S stays unaffected. And so S contains 1, 2, 3, and M contains 14, 2, 3, 4. So let's look at a different scenario. Um, often when you work with slices, you know, Go is kind of trying to stay ahead of you, and it's going to try to give your slice a capacity that's big enough that if you add anything more to it, it, doesn't, it isn't forced to do what we just did. So if you work around with it, you might very likely end up in a scenario where the capacity is larger than the length. So in this case, I'm forcing that situation because I'm using make, and I'm just telling it, you know, make a slice that has a capacity of six. I'm giving it one, two, three, and now if we look at it, we see that the length is three, but the capacity is six, so there's still some space left. Okay, I'm gonna call append again, and again, we're gonna use copy on append, and this time Go is gonna see, oh, there's still some capacity left. I don't have to do anything. I'm just going to add a 4. Easy peasy. So in this case, S and M are pointing to the same underlying array. And if we print them, we see that the original S is 14, 2, 3. And M is 14, 2, 3, 4. Wait a second, Miriam, you might now say. But you just said they're pointing to the same array. Why does one of them have four entries and the other one has three? Okay. So in order to explain that, I'm going to use my amazing animation styles. I hope you're ready. So here we have what a slice looks like. And here we have what S and M look like. Great. So here's the array in memory. Address 0. Yes, you can see S and M both point to address 0, to the same spot in memory, to the same array. But the big difference is that S has a length of 3, while M has a length of 4. So when we try to get the values from S, it's going to start at address 0, and it's going to go 1, 2, 3, and it's going to give us three values. When we ask M for the contents, it's going to give us 14, 2, 3, 4, and return those. And that's why they're both pointing at the same thing, but giving us different results. And that often happens when you do slicing, and then you can run into really nasty bugs, because you're not realizing that this sort of stuff is happening under the hood. So, you know, now you're aware, and you can use the inbuilt copy function in order to force Go to make a copy of the underlying array, and then you won't run into any of this. Yeah, reference objects, they're fun. So let's look at another one, maps. OK, so one more quiz. Here, we're initializing m as a map, string int, and it's empty. We're gonna, then going to hand it to a function called addLife, and we're going to print m. And that's it. So what's happening in addLife? It takes the map. 
it's then going to add to it the value life, uh, sorry, the key life and the value 42. And that's it. No pointers here. Nothing's happening. So what do you think will happen when we print M? Okay. Cool. Raise your hand if you think we're going to print an empty map. Raise your hand if you think we're going to print a map containing the key value life 42. Raise your hand if you think we're going to panic. Great. Okay. So the correct result is we're going to print map life 42. Reason for that is that a map is a reference object. It holds a pointer to an underlying hash map because hash maps can be very big. Map is, this, is abstracting all of that away for us. The downside of that is, and it happens with maps more than with slices, you're passing around a map and you think you're passing around a copy, but a copy of an address still points to the same spot in memory, and so you're actually modifying the underlying object. Yeah, so that's something to be careful about. Um, there is panic here for a reason, though. So if my code had been slightly different, and I had declared m to be a map, but I hadn't initialized it, so it's still nil by the time I pass it to add life, then we're going to run into a panic right here because we're trying to access a nil. So something to be aware of, if you're getting slices or maps from someone and you don't trust them, check if they're nil first before you do anything with them. Okay, I'm warmed up, I hope you are, so let's look at the eternal question. Should I use a pointer or a value? So there's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot to say about pointers. I can't cover it all. Um, for me, I've condensed my thoughts around it into three major considerations. The first one is performance, right? How much will using a pointer actually speed things up for me? The second one is nilability. So like, do you need to be able to differentiate between nil and the default value? And lastly, mutability. Do you want to grant access to the underlying value? So let's look at them. So first we have performance. Um, here we have another ChatGPT special. Um, we'll see a few of them throughout the presentation. So performance. So when it comes to performance, I was kind of thinking, assuming, always a bad one, that pointers are small. Pointers are the smallest thing, therefore they're so efficient, right? Um, but if we look at the actual types that are given to us, um, there's a bunch of them that are smaller or equal in size to pointers, because pointers clock in at eight bytes, as do maps, because they hold a pointer. Um, then, when we look at larger things than pointers, so here we have an interface and a string, they're both, who 16 bytes each. That's because an interface holds two pointers, and a string holds a pointer and an int for its length. Then we have a slice, we already looked at slices. Slices hold a pointer and two int fields, so they're of size 24, three times eight. And then lastly, here come the interesting ones, structs and arrays. So those might be pretty big, right? Like a large array can be a large array. Let's say we have an array, but a small array is a small array. So an array of size zero is zero bytes. But an array that has 10 um, ints in it, um, or at least allocated that much memory, is already 10 times 8, 80 bytes big. Okay, so it can, it can go up. However, arrays aren't that popular, are they? Um, and I kind of ran into wanting to know how big things are when I tried to make a benchmark, because I wanted to know how quick pointers are, and I realized that it's kind of hard to figure out because Go abstracts everything away and makes everything small already, makes everything pointers. So in the end, I just used an array, and I just made it ridiculously large, and that worked. So I'm going to give you the results. So Eight kilobytes is, in my work, a lot of data. I don't usually like pass much more than that around. And if I pass that to my benchmark, I saw that a pointer used around four nanoseconds per operation, while a value used 108 nanoseconds per operation. So here we see a speed increase of 260 times. That's nice, I like that, that's good. Okay, let's go bigger. Eight megabytes, ooh. Now I'm seeing a speed increase of 180,000 times. That's pretty convincing. Let's look down at 80 bytes. We talked about 80 bytes before, you know, an array that has 10 fields of int. Um, here we're seeing a speed increase of 1.4 times. It's not that impressive. Okay, not sure about that one. So that's my entire benchmark. And if you look at it, you kind of think, okay, so, you know, there is a proper speed increase. I'm seeing the point. I'm going to use pointers from now on for everything. This is great. 
And yeah, you know, big data, lots of uh, improvement. But if we look at the actual size of things, many things aren't actually that big. So I guess my takeaways for this one are that size matters. If you pass around a lot of data, you're going to see awesome speed increases, performance increases. But Go already does a lot of optimization for you. So a lot of things you might think are big aren't actually that big because, you know, a slice is hiding away the large array, or your struct have, might have maps or slices in it, or pointers to other things, and so all of it might not be as large as you were thinking. And if you make everything pointers, then you might have a slowdown on other parts of your program. So I don't have time to get into this, but if you use pointers for everything, then you might put a strain on your garbage collector, and that might actually slow down things more than it increases the speed if you're working with small bits of data. So if you're interested in that sort of like low-level optimization, then I really re recommend that you read up on garbage collectors. Um, these slides have at the end a bunch of resources. Um, partly about this one. Okay, so let's talk about nilability next. So nilability is a good one. Um, in an error case, well, step back. If, as you probably know in Go, we usually return a tuple from functions, right? Data, error. So we can each either return value error. So in this case, I'm returning the initialized struct example and an error, in an error case, obviously. Or I can return pointer error. So in an error case, I can return nil error. Now, both of that is totally fine. Both of that is absolutely correct way of using Go. But there's one case that was actually mentioned already this morning where it does matter. And that's this. That is someone ignoring an error that's being returned from your function and just la di dying on with the value you gave them. And I have seen that in production level code too, and apparently others have as well. It is unfortunately not uncommon. So what happens if I'm returning an initialized struct to that, as well as my error, and they're ignoring it? That means that they keep, can keep working with v as if it was a valid result and keep passing it on because it's an initialized thing. They can work with it, it's fine. However, if I'm returning a pointer and an error, I'm giving them nil, a nil. V is a nil, and they can still keep using it if they want, but I'm pretty sure they're gonna run into a panic sooner rather than later. Both of it is not great, but you basically have a choice between failing hard and fast and failing slowly and potentially silently. And when it comes to me, I prefer failing hard and fast because then I can fix it quickly and it hopefully doesn't go to production. And that's why, personally, I try to always return pointer error tuples. It just, yeah, makes things safer if you don't trust what's going to happen with your returned values. Speaking of trust issues, I have another one. So in my line of work, I hit a lot of other APIs, third-party APIs, and often legacy services. And I have learned very quickly not to trust what's coming back to me. I've been burned one too many times. So let's look at an example here. Let's say we're getting an incoming payload, which is username Jane Doe and an empty email. So I have several ways I can work with that. I want to unmarshal it into user profile, which is a struct. And all of the fields there are just like the basic types, like strings and ints. And you might already notice that I'm expecting a subscription level to come in here, but I'm not getting it. So what is Go going to do in this case? it's going to make the subscription level a zero because that's the default value for an int. Okay. So if I don't do any further checks, I might keep working with this as if, if it's a fair and a given value, even though maybe the payload is corrupted, like maybe something went wrong here. So that can be a bit of an issue. And on my first project, we were working with like a giant XML payload that was coming in, and we were like, oof, we don't trust this at all. We're going to be smart about this. We're going to make everything pointers. Because then, if I unmarshal it, subscription level is going to be nil. And I will know that they didn't pass it to me, and I can act accordingly. And that seemed like a great strategy um, until, you know, one day I was my, on my umpteenth if blah does not equal nil check, and it was a very nested. It was very nested data, so it was like, if field one does not equal nil, if field one dot field two not does not equal nil, if field one dot field two dot field three does not equal nil, and it was like Java S code at the end of it. And we were not having a great time, 
but more importantly, it was really error prone because it's so easy to overlook something in that case and it's so tedious to write test cases for it. I know that good testing is everything. We've learned so this morning. But it's still, it's a pain. It's a pain to write like a struct where single fields are not missing over and over. So that was not the solution, is what we discovered in hindsight. But making everything values is not a solution either, because yeah, you can be like, oh, I'm gonna be like protobuf, and zero means un, you know, un invalid, and empty string means invalid. But like that doesn't always work, and also what about a bool? Is false always invalid? Can't really recommend that either. So really what it comes down to is check your data before you unmarshal it. Like, don't rely on pointers here, they're not the answer. Instead, you know, there's great libraries out there for checking incoming payloads, there's JSON tags. You can do a lot of things to make sure that the data you get is good before you start working with it. And then, and then you know, don't use pointers at that point. Yeah, use those. Okay, so what are our takeaways? Consider how colleagues may handle your returned data. Validate incoming data before unmarshalling it. And if x does not equal nil, checks are tedious. Very helpful at times, but tedious. Okay, and so up onto the last one. So that one is mutability. It's my favorite one. I think it's very interesting. And that's because when you talk about pointers, the discussion very often boils down to one concept. If you want to allow functions to modify the original, use pointers. If you don't want that, use values. That rings true, right? There's nothing wrong with that statement. That's, yeah, we're all nodding along, okay. So the moment we nod along with something, we should explore it. So I think the first thing people think of when they say that sentence, and by the way, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying let's explore it. Um, the first thing people think of is parameters. So they're saying, oh, you know, we have here a function called modify me. I'm passing to it to the pointer to don't panic, and now I'm able to modify that and, you know, change its field to true. And I don't have to do anything else, I've modified the underlying struct, the underlying data. So that's great. Um, yeah, totally valid. But I don't think it's a strong argument for why we need to use pointers, because I can achieve just the same thing with this. Size might be a topic here, of course, you know, if you're passing around values and making copies all the time, but overall, I can achieve the same effect here. So not an argument for, not an argument against in my books. Another area where people think pointers are helpful is when they want to control access to fields. So, this is gonna be a quiz. I'm gonna walk you through the code. I hope you're ready. Here, I am creating a package library, and I am creating an object in it, it's a struct, and it has a field, capital letters, with a map, int, int. Okay, and now we have someone who's calling my package here in main. So they're gonna initialize the object, give it the values one, one, so the key value on one. And then they're gonna call their own function called add. And then they're gonna print O. And what's happening in add? Add takes a copy of the object, a key and a value, and it adds it to the object's field. What do you think is going to happen when I print O? You have a bit of time to think about it. Okay. Cool, so who here thinks that our underlying object was modified and we're gonna print one, one and two, two? Raise your hand. Great. Who here thinks we're gonna print one, one? Raise your hand. And who here thinks that our code is not going to compile? Cool, okay. The result is we're gonna change the underlying object. I got a syntax? Oh my God, okay. Sure, that's what I get. Okay, assuming we wrote everything correctly, <laughs> we will print <laughs> one, one, two, two. Fair point, don't compile people, fair point. But let's say, you know, good intentions. It's gonna give us one, one, two, two. The reason for that is that the field is a map and a map is a ha holds a pointer and therefore we can actually modify it even though we're just passing around copies. The same would be true if my field was a string, for example, but then I passed it through as a pointer, a pointer to the actual object in add. Then I could also modify it. So pointers are not actually helping us control 
access to anything. Instead, making things private does. So here we have exactly the same code. We're just making the capitalized field a lowercase field. Now it is private to my library. And if anyone tries any shenanigans in another package, the code is not going to compile because it is private. So that's how you control access to fields. Another one that comes up when we talk about um, being able to modify things is pointer versus value receivers. That's actually one of the most asked questions I found on Stack Overflow when I was looking into pointers. Should I use a pointer receiver or a value receiver? Okay, so we're gonna do another quiz. <laughs> so here I'm creating the type counter. It holds a field count. And I'm gonna make it a pointer receiver to two methods. The first one is question, which will print, will this print? And the second one is increment, which will increment the count field and then print the C, will print the counter. Okay, and now I'm gonna test it. So here I am declaring C to be a pointer to counter, but I'm not initializing it. So it is nil at this point when I call question. What's gonna happen? Will the call be successful or will it panic? Raise your hand if you think that we will print, will this print? Raise your hand if you think our code is going to panic. Mm -hmm. The answer is, it will print. Ah, huh. okay, well, great. Apparently it doesn't matter, let's call increment. No, no, now we're running into a panic. Ugh, why is that? The reason for that is that function, uh, sorry, that methods in Go are just syntactic sugar for functions that are taking the um, receiver as the first parameter, right? So it's not very complicated, let me visualize it. So one side is equal to the other side. So what is happening in question? When I pass through C as nil in question, we weren't doing anything with it. So we just printed something and everything was fine and it compiled and it printed and everyone was happy. However, in increment, when we pass through nil at runtime, when it tries to access C, and its field, it's gonna see a nil, it's gonna panic because it won't know what to do. And so really what it boils down to is pointer and value receivers, they're not, they're not special. If you need to make a decision between choosing one or the other, make the same considerations that you do when you choose to pass a parameter by pointer or by value. It's the same thing. Or is it? Hold on, Miriam, what about interfaces? That's why we do methods, we're not doing them for fun. Okay, so interfaces are really, really interesting. I had to like cut out half of this talk because it was just about interfaces. Instead, I'm gonna give you the short version. So let's look at interfaces. Here we have an interface being defined, reader interface, and it has the function read on it. As you can see, it's not telling me anything about the receiver. It's not asking for a pointer or value receiver. So I can implement it with a pointer receiver. I can implement it with a value receiver. It's gonna be fine either way. Both of these implement the reader interface just fine. There are like some edge cases where you have to be careful when you work with interfaces and pointer and value receivers. But in general, here's my top tip. If you could declare something to be a pointer receiver, then call that method on it when it is a pointer, on it as its pointer. And if you declare something as a value receiver, then call it on its value. And then nothing will happen. Okay, so Again, another topic where, you know, being able to mutate something might be important is concurrency. It's a big one. So some of you were able to attend Roman's workshop yesterday on concurrency, so you already know all of that. But for the rest of you, I'm gonna give you the Cliff Notes version. It comes down to one sentence. If there's shared state between threads, anything might happen. So the moment you allow multiple threads to mutate an underlying value, you're gonna run into some trouble. So, how can we safely do concurrency when it comes to you know, pointers? Well, if all of your threads are just doing reads, then you have no worries because there's no mutation going on, they're just reading it, you can pass around pointers, get all of the great benefits from that, everything will be fine. The moment you need to do writes, you need to use the sync package. So that one's gonna give you uh, mutexes, it's gonna give you concurrency safe versions of maps and slices. So that's the one you want to look out for. If you're finding yourself, however, I want you to take a second and think. If you find yourself needing to basically hold all the threads 
while they and have them wait for one thread to mutate a shared object. And maybe, are you really needing to run things in parallel? Maybe it is a sign that you could make things a bit simpler and you don't need to do all of this concurrency stuff in the first place, or you could just, you know, change your implementation a little as a side thought. And if you're in general not sure and you want to stay from the safe side, then just pass around values. Don't pass around, don't give them access to pointers. Okay, so what are our takeaways? Pointers don't grant or deny access. Use private or public definitions for that. Receivers are syntactic sugar. Treat them just like you would with parameters. And don't allow shared state between concurrent threads. Okay, so we've talked about the three big categories. That's gonna bring us down to the big answer. Should we use pointers or values? And it is, it depends. <laughs> As everything, it's trade-offs. Always comes down to trade-offs. So size matters, you know? Speed increase is really realized when you use bigger objects. Nil versus default. If x does not equal nil, it's a real blessing and it is a curse. So tread carefully. Mutability is great. Allo pointers allow mutability, but they do not allow you control over it. And finally, kind of like the underlying message of this entire presentation, Go does a lot for you already. Most optimization is already done under the hood. A lot of the very big um, data types are stripped away and hidden under maps and slices um, by using structs that hold these or pointers to other things. So, you know, you, you might not have to actually think that much about improving the speed of your code unless you do a lot of, you know, um, like, scientific programming or low level, pro that's something different. But if you're in general business applications like I am, then maybe think most about code design when it comes to pointers. You know, what's gonna make your code good to use, good to read, extendable, et cetera, like long lasting. And maybe have that, let that be your main consideration when you choose between pointers and values. Great, thank you all so much and yeah. If you can download the slides here.